Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. Uh, very fortunate to have with us today Heather Kukazella. She's the principal of Immaculate Conception School in Towson, Maryland. Uh, also with us is Olivia Collison. She's a middle school ELA English language arts teacher. And uh, we're just excited to hear how this small independent school has been dealing with all of the pandemic things this spring. Heather and Olivia, thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Uh, let's start with just a quick description of the school, who are the students and family that you serve, what's kind of the basic instructional approach there? Like, just tell us a little bit about ICS. Sure, so I I'm happy to kick things off, but um, Ms. Collison, if I miss anything or you think anything else is pertinent, you just chime on in, please. Um, so we are a pre-K to eight uh, parochial school right outside of Baltimore in Maryland. And our community hovers right around 500 students, about 360 families that we serve. The majority of the folks that attend our school are here because of our, um, our faith-based mission. Um, and so that really sort of binds our community just sort of naturally. Um, but we, we do tend to have a pretty rigorous and aggressive curriculum here. Um, our, our teachers are pretty serious and we certainly uh, work very hard to make sure that each of our students at each level is working to their full potential and that we are trying to create that sort of problem solver mentality within our student so that they can hopefully learn to grow and adapt. And I think maybe perhaps the pandemic has been proof positive why it is we need to be flexible, collaborative, and problem solvers. Absolutely. Awesome. So Olivia and Heather, tell us what a rigorous problem solving oriented curriculum looks like at ICS. And then what did that look like as you transition into remote? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I can tell you that right before the literally right before the pandemic struck, um, we had just finished up this fantastic STEM project in my sixth grade class because we do STEM projects in every single class um, in the middle school each trimester. Um, and the students had to research, use Newzella, different uh, online resources that ended up being very useful later on um, to uh, research different environmental issues, and then they had to read actual environmental action plans that create were created by sustainable urban planners, and then they had to become sustainable urban planners, and they had to name a fictional town, and then they took on those positions, and they had to collaborate across uh, waste management, transportation, uh, power, and water, and decide where different uh, buildings were going to go, and there were lots of conflicts, and it did not nothing got solved, but that's what they learned was that there are problems that are way more complex than they could even fathom solving, but they learned so much through that process. It was amazing. And then they were able to translate those. They, they truly felt like a team going into the pandemic, which I felt was a tremendous difference when it came to, you know, flip grids and every Zoom session, they, they were dying to just do more collaboration. So um, that, that, to me is what that higher order problem solving looks like in action. Absolutely. Uh, I think Ms. Collison describes it beautifully. Uh, and I think really that was a, a decision that we made along the way. We sort of could see that the closures were coming and we let staff know right away uh, to sort of expect that we were going to be working from home. And the idea was going to be not that we would just do review or sort of maintain um, skills that had already been acquired, but work to find new ways of instructing the group so that we were continuing the learning and continuing the collaborative process, even though now the medium was different than what we were normally used to. So um, as you transitioned online, what are some of those remote interactions and collaborations look like for students? I know one of the the key is it was a minor one, but a key one that they noticed very quickly was that we got rid of the concepts, parts of vocabulary quizzes and grammar quizzes and that types of those those memorization type deals um, where they 
they had to, you know, memorize. A, it's important to know a root and then the, the Latin or Greek root and then the English meaning, but that's something that they can easily Google and then there's no accountability there for that learning. So uh, it became very apparent to us, uh, my co-planner and I very early on that we had to get rid of that and make it all about application. So they, instead of doing, you know, uh, memorize what that word means and then what's the definition verbatim instead it was make up a sentence that logically uses that word and then uh, perform a skit using Flipgrid that integrates that word so without even using it and you know kind of a charades type deal and th kind of thinking outside of the box um, in terms of our assessments things that we would we normally take out of you know a textbook um, but even the simplest things, because that is the, you know, we try to avoid that type of thing, but vocab, you know, grammar, you think textbook, that's simple. No, gotta get rid of that now and bring out the new stuff. But it, it I mean, I, I definitely feel like those kids will remember those words and use those words more often now that they've seen their friends make a really silly skit about it and then had to then write on a, you know, on a, a dry erase board on their iPads and say, this is what that word means, completely new way to apply that same, that same uh, concept. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Heather, how about in the younger grades? What's that, what's that look like a little bit? Yeah. So um, similarly, I think the adaptability uh, of, of the medium was the key piece. So uh, teachers, instead of saying, let me show you something, let's talk about something, and then perhaps the teaching have the teacher having materials at the ready. The difference now became, we all need to interact with our environments virtually. So on the fly, the teacher would introduce a concept, a theory, a notion, and then say, you have 30 seconds to go in your home and find something that resonates with you, something that's indicative of that concept. And I think, not that, we would prefer that virtual medium because we don't. We love the in-person, we love that connectivity with the kids, but I think what it did was it allowed for a little bit more creativity and involvement on the part of all of the students because everybody was really on the hook to go find whatever that item was and get back and then explain themselves. So maybe, you know, I would go and grab a pen and Ms. Collison would go and grab her dog these are two totally different things, but if we can find a way to explain how they connect to the concept, now we're all engaging in that learning in a very different way. Um, and I found that that happened from the very early stages, pre-K all the way up through eighth grade. And I think that was a, an important piece of the puzzle. So it feels like the ICS teachers have really stepped up and tried to be as creative and adaptive as possible, um, which is great, right? What are some of those skill sets or new teaching practices that you saw emerge this spring that you all would like to hold on to in the fall, regardless of format? So well, I certainly have some. Ms. Collison, do you have something you'd like to share first? No, no, you go first. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Um, so we had already made use of uh, Google Classroom as a platform for assignments. It was really more on the back burner for somebody who was absent that really got pushed to the forefront. So now we knew that was the, the way we were communicating documents and assessments. So I think teachers appreciating all that that platform has to offer and the benefits to being organized digitally is something that I hope that we take from this. I think historically teachers have been really great record keepers with folders and those sorts of things. I think those are now antiquated notions and we appreciate the need to diversify uh, and use some of these new platforms as we do our regular work. And piggybacking on that, the idea of communication, I feel like was crucial just in general. So any, any sort of uh, technology that will help us improve that communication, but also you know, when we're actually physically back in the classroom, having all of these different resources in order to, you know, there, there won't be, I don't want to say, for lack of a better word, there, there won't be any excuse not to collaborate to the fullest extent possible. Um, and uh, also, 
kind of on the flip side of that, I feel like we learned a lot about mental health through this whole process and the importance of finding a, a healthy balance between technology and, uh, you know, social life. Uh, so making sure that going back into the fall, we're also considering that same balance to, to maintain students' well-being. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm hearing from a number of schools that there's no way to possibly over-communicate this past spring, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, um, and how do we keep up some of those robust practices, particularly around checking in on kids' and families' well-being, which maybe we took for granted a little bit because we saw the kid in school and we didn't do that kind of home outreach in ways um, has been pretty robust. And it sounds like you're articulating some interesting learning and teaching practices that probably will carry forward as well, right, as you sort of adapt to whatever the new mediums are. So I'm interested in this question since I've got uh, both a teacher and a principal here. Um, Olivia, we're going to start with you. What were some of the decisions that the leadership team of the school made that you felt worked well for you as an instructor? And then Heather, maybe you can add to that in terms of what kind of decisions were you making that seemed to work well for your community? Absolutely. Um, well, to start everything, uh, very ironically, uh, our Heather, uh, this is her first year as principal, by the way, um, ever. Yeah, <laughs> um, quite the year. Um, but she decided to start this year as, uh, I remember uh, Mickey Mouse going up on the big screen at, on day one, uh, that this would be the year of customer service. And so she, carrying that forward into the closure could not have been more perfect i mean so i remember on march or march 11th was when things were starting to we learned that with field trips would be canceled so we learned that at a faculty meeting and the march 12th the decision was announced but we got an email from heather that evening that was like a novel and i read every single book like i read every page it was so thorough and i could not have been more thankful and then going into that friday on on march 13th that we knew that we were gonna be ending the school day early, kids were gonna be packing up, the kids were getting into that mentality, we were setting, expect that was not a day of teaching, that was a day of setting expectations. So doing that helped um, tremendously with the teaching process because the kids knew this was not break, this was not snow days, this was you need to bring your textbooks home because we're getting to work on Monday. And I'm, I've, I've actually been in grad school for two years for instructional technology. So my kids were like, oh, okay, oh, buckle up. Um, and they were right. We hit the ground running on Monday and we did not stop from there. Um, and then knowing, keeping the kids informed and us knowing that this would be flexible and that everything was very much as soon as Heather knew, we would know, but Heather doesn't know everything because no one knows everything. And that's just the way, it, but knowing that not being, you know, I don't know what we would have done if we had been lied to, it would have been more devastating. You know, it was, I felt like I was on the same page as my principal. And I felt like that was tremendously helpful as, as an educator, you know, as an instructor side. Um, and then just the last part of that would be that when, Heather realized, you know, this was going to be a long-term type thing, setting that schedule for Zooms and we did, and, and posting assignments. There was not a single day that I was not giving my kids work or, you know, there were three days a week that I was seeing them face to face. It was all very routine and that was amazing for the kids too. So I had, I have only good things to say about my administration. So it was, it was an amazing experience. It really was. I, I personally really enjoyed every you know challenge and opportunity that it had to offer yeah no pressure at all ollie yeah. in answering yeah. those questions with me here <laughs> no i'm just kidding um yeah so i i think i was a, a teacher myself here in this same building before becoming an administrator and i was also a parent for many years of students here my kids are older so i i think i tried to view things from each of those lenses what is it like to be a person on the inside? What is it like to have the pressures of being the educator? But also, what is it like to be that parent on the receiving end of it? So I, I think for us in administration, we try to approach it. And Scott, you had mentioned before, there's no such thing as shortage of communication. It's again and again and again and again. Uh, we, we really kind of took that to heart. And I think for us, we could see the writing on the wall. We saw things coming. 
And as Ali mentioned, I just tried to tell people, we really need to start living every day as if this is the last day that we're in the building. We don't want to be caught unaware. So let's start putting that in our mindset and then be ready to go uh, when we're home. And as she mentioned about customer service, I mean, I, I do think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Obviously, I'm an educator first and foremost, and our students are our mission but their parents are our customers. And that's in a really important piece of the puzzle here. And, and I think for the, the students to feel confident, to feel supported, they have to know that their parents also feel those things too. So for us kind of going into it and saying to each other, it will be difficult, we will make mistakes, that's okay, we're gonna just learn from it, we're going to be open to the options, and to let our parents know that their feedback was listened to and that it was really important as we fine tuned what our program would look like. I think those are the things that help with some of the successes that we had. Feels like you got a nice, uh, solid, tightly bonded, bonded community there, which uh, I think helps quite a bit. So it does. And both of you have talked about your history with the school and, and the community, and so that's great. Um, challenges, considerations moving forward, what are you all thinking about over the summer and into the fall? Well, I, I know for me personally, it's just the uncertainty like everybody else, not knowing what it'll look like. I think it, each of the phases, whether it's in-person, hybrid, or remote, there are unique challenges to each of those things. So just trying to position ourselves so that we are best prepared to meet those needs, whatever it may be. I think that's really the big thing. And, and really, I, I think just if we could kind of flip and look at why did remote learning work the way it did, it's due in large part to the fact that we had two thirds of a year to establish relationships, routines, and rapport, and then we went virtual. I think establishing those things virtually in the beginning or disconnected with smaller groups may be a bit more of a challenge, but I mean, that's our, that's our task to problem solve and adapt to that, but that's something that I'm concerned about. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of that from schools and particularly if the, um, the risk of having to close back down Mm -hmm. um, after a partial startup. And so I'm hearing a lot of school organizations talk about how do we very quickly ramp up relationships with a new teacher and a new classroom community? How do we help our students gain whatever executive sort of functioning and self-directed learning skills they need in case we do have to go remote on you know, a minute's notice? Um, how do we make sure all the tech skills are there, right, in terms of understanding of tools and platforms? Yeah, it's going to be a wild ride this fall. So but <laughs> all of that stuff first, before we even start thinking about, you know, sort of content, um, mm -hmm. because otherwise we'll miss our window of opportunity. That's Absolutely. right. Okay, so we're kind of at the end of our time. Thank you so much for sharing the ICS story. Uh, any last things you want to share here before we say goodbye? Thank you yeah. so much for the opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you for the time. And, and I just have to say for myself, it was a total blessing to work with the team that I had. And I think just like with the kids, the relationships are so important and that respect and that professionalism, open dialogue. We are all here. Nobody's perfect. Nobody knows the answer. We're all working uh, on behalf of the kids. And once you have that, I mean, my heart goes out to teachers and schools all over the country. Everybody's doing their best work. Absolutely. All right. That's a great way to end our conversation. Heather and Olivia, thanks so much. Say goodbye. Bye. Take care. <laughs>